So let's talk about the accounting profession just a bit. And also it's fun. You know, if you're interested in accounting, it's a fun topic. Employers, there's certainly CPA firms. I got to tell you, the lion's share of our students go to work for big CPA firms, really big ones, top national or top local firms, you know, certainly top 100 firms, probably most of them are going to work for the big four, top 10, top 20 firms. Most of them are going to work for CPA firms and they are getting their CPA certificate. To get your CPA certificate, you go through the course of study and you take the Becker CPA review. Got to do it. Becker CPA review, they will get you through the CPA exam and you'll get through it. You could also work in industry like, like I did and Mario did. Mario worked for Exxon. I worked for Dow Chemical. These guys that work in industry, they usually, I find the accounting is more nuts and bolts and actually deeper than the CPAs and their auditing and stuff. But, um, uh, but it's only, it's only the one company, you know? And, and so uh, great place, you know, there are some great places to work. Uh, Dow Chemical was fantastic. Um, they promoted from within, which is a, a huge thing. And uh, the work was great, very complicated accounting, very complicated business going on. It was uh uh, truly rewarding. Um, financial institutions. A lot of our graduates go to work for big banks, you know, go to work in New York, you know, um, and, uh, you know, they, they get rich. <laughs> they do real well. Of course, some of the CPA guys, they're, they're getting pretty rich too, especially some of the CPA guys that later on jump into industry. Oh my God, they're doing very well, very well. You could also go to work for a government institution. You can do that if, if, if that's your if that's your calling. There's all kinds of government institutions that would love to have accountants on board. Some of them are really kind of exciting. You know, the FBI, the CIA, they're always looking. They're always looking, especially for accounting people. Um, uh, not for profit organizations. If that's your calling to help, you know, to help uh, the world, um, you know, become a better place. Plenty of room for uh, uh, accountants in those organizations and many, many others. So it's a very diversified uh, field and everybody needs accountants. So areas of specialization. This is important. This is important because soon you guys are going to be interviewing for internships and jobs. And you're probably going to be trying to get a job with a big CPA firm, you know, because those are the most prestigious jobs. Big CPA firms are some of the most prestigious uh, companies on the planet. Uh, KPMG, Deloitte, uh, PwC, they're global. They're in every bit, big city. You know, they've got a named building, you know, in Beijing and Shanghai and in every major city. So very cool to go to work for them. Um, now, when you go to interview, they are going to ask you, are you interested in audit or are you interested in taxation? Unbelievably, you need to decide. And, and you say, and you know, like for me, I would say, well, I really want to work for your company so bad. I'll do either one. Oh, no, no, no. That's not what they want to hear. And here's why. Because the people that do the hiring and the auditing group are different from the people that do the hiring in the, in the taxation group. And so you got to pick one of them so they know who you're going to interview with, right? So you got to sort of come up with a specialization, either taxation. And if you're going for taxation, probably you need to get, well, definitely, definitely. If you're going for taxation, you must be going for the M. MST degree, the MST, the MST. Got to go for the MST. And the reason for that is that to, you know, be a CPA in one of these taxation departments for one of these big firms, they require an advanced degree in taxation. And the reason they require it is because all the low level uh, 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 tax work is being shipped off to on over the internet to, you know, uh, third world countries to have it done. And, 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 and you're really doing the high end work. Okay. And so they required an MST. Now, what about auditing and insurance for auditing and insurance? You can get the master of science and accounting. That's good. That's great. Uh, or, or if you want the MST for auditing, it, the, the, the auditing group is not going to be picky. Uh, they'll take you if you got a master of science in accounting, no problem. But if you get an MST, they'll also take you just as though you had a master of accounting. So if you're going to the master of taxation, I mean, if you're going for taxation, get a master's in tax. If you're not sure, I don't know, go for the MST, I think. Uh, but if, if you're sure you want to go into auditing, you know, master of science in accounting is uh, 
is great. What we used to call the master of accounting degree. So uh, either way, so you got to pick. Now you could go into advisory. Like uh, there are some firms, um, uh, Wor Werther, I think is one, a top 25 firm. They hire right into their advisory group. Berkowitz, Pollock and Brandt, uh, a, a top, you know, a top 50 firm in the country, but it's a local firm in Miami. They hire into their advisory group. Most of the, the big four and most of the big top accounting firms don't hire into their advisory group. They hire into audit and taxation. And then from there, uh, uh, people move later on in their careers to their advisory group. It's, it's not always that way, but 99% of the time. So it's great to say, oh, I'm going to get into advisory and consulting, consulting and so forth. But uh, depending on the firm, uh, that may be the second phase of your career with one of these big firms. So you could also work in industry, in accounting, uh, financial accounting and reporting, management accounting, uh, taxation, huge in these big multinational companies, uh, internal auditing, which takes auditing to a whole different level of, uh, of I mean, it, it's crazy. Uh, uh, auditing and assurance for a CPA firm you know, you're looking generally at the company to see, you know, that they're following all the rules and there's no fraud and so forth. Uh, internal auditing, they look at every minute detail to make sure everybody is following every accounting rule in the world and every accounting policy within the company. So it, it's much more detailed. And I think we've got a course um, Dan Medina teaches, I believe, on internal auditing. And so, uh, yeah, you, you could become an internal auditor. And there, there are just many, many more uh, areas. Uh, and, and I got to tell you, you might start off here and end up in banking, having your own business, whatever. Accounting is not something that people pick up through their life. As they live their life, they don't pick up accounting. You can pick up law. You can even pick up forensics, forensics like police forensics. Uh, I consider myself to be almost an expert in police forensics. I know exactly how to investigate a murder. And how do I know? No, because I've watched the forensic files so many times. I've watched it over and over and over again. And, and I know about DNA and fingerprints and fires and everything. I pick it up off TV. You, you Management. You can pick up management because you've been managed your whole life. And people are managing you. You're managing others. Marketing. Oh, my God. Every time we turn, get on the Internet, we're, we're being marketed to. Every time we try to sell something, we're marketing. Uh, there's all kinds of TV shows, LA law, you know, uh, uh, what's it house or whatever the medical shows uh, you can pick up a lot on TV and through your life. However, you can't pick up accounting. You can't pick up accounting uh, on television, in the newspaper. You can't get it anywhere except through formal studies. We do not have a movie about accounting. We do not have a TV series about account. We do have one movie, one movie about accounting, which is one of my favorite movies called The Accountant. If you haven't seen it, you ought to see it. It's the craziest accountant in the world, but it is a great movie, uh, quite an adventure. But aside from that movie, uh, you can't pick it up off the streets. You've got to go through formal study. So because of that, no matter what field you go into, you are going to have the edge over everybody else with all the other degrees because they're going to know about the business, but you are going to know how that business is depicted in financial reports and in taxation documents and so forth, and they won't. So when the conference room is filled with 30 people and they're trying to make big decisions on what to do, they're going to be looking down the table at you because you're going to know the accounting and nobody else will. So it's really a great degree. So anyway, um, some of the top firms, you know, CPA firms, there's, you know, small local firms, medium local firms, large local and regional firms, top 25 firms, top 10 firms. And then there's the big four you hear about Deloitte, ENY, which is Ernst & Young. Uh, sometimes Deloitte is called D&T for Deloitte and & Touche. In Asia, in China, I see I have some Chinese folks here, uh, Deloitte, Touche, Tomatsu. And then you have uh, KPMG. And then you have uh, PWC, which stands for PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, from when they merged. So these are the big four. Uh, a lot of individuals would love to go to work for these guys. Uh, a lot of them, though, a lot of students, I've had a fair number of our top, top students that have chosen to go with a large, massive local firm or, you know, top 25 or top 10 firm just because it fits better with their personality and what's going on in the office is something they're happier with. 
So uh, it's all up to you. Uh, with respect to the top firms, here they are. This is uh, the top uh, 25. This Look at that, top 20. It's actually top 25 firms, top 25 firms. Um, Deloitte, far and away the biggest, followed by PwC. And, and listen, these numbers are about, are about a year and a half old, so they're not quite current. Uh, I, I, I got them recently, but the more recent numbers are not available. Uh, are, uh, and then KPMG, look, look here, from KPMG to the next firm down, there's a massive gap in the revenue. But still, these next few, look at these guys, down, 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 into, down into here, you know, millions, millions of dollars in revenues, millions. Now down here, it's not millions, but it's close. It's close. It's close, okay? So um, yeah, these this is a list of the firms, um, and and I can send you this PowerPoint so you can take a look at them all later. Uh, this firm, this firm, one of our our students that graduated from the program is is working for them now, uh, uh, with them, and it's a it's it's really number twenty five. Even though in this list it's listed as twenty six, it's twenty five or twenty four. Um, they're very interested in hiring UM students. Its uh, revenues have almost. Are going to be like half again higher than this uh, this coming year. It sounds like it's a tremendous firm. This guy is working with them, and he's very very pleased, and he wants to get a UM presence to see if he can pick up some uh, UM students. Now this firm does hire into their advisory group directly, and that's where he's going to work in their advisory group. Then you have uh, MBAF. This is a Miami firm based in Miami. Firm. Uh, let's see what else we got. Who else we got? Now we're going down to the uh, 50 to 75. You got uh, Kaufman and Rawson, massive firm, number 62 uh, in the country. Revenues of 60 of $82 million, almost $83 million. It's huge. Berkowitz, Pollock, and Brandt, BPB, a uh, very big presence uh, at the University of Miami. Amy campus. Uh, some of our best, best students have gone to work for them and within no time, they're managers. It's unbelievable. Um, but anyway, uh, almost $68 million in revenue. Uh, Shulman and Company, it's, it's a 66 million. They're a Tampa firm. They're a Tampa firm. But you see, we got some Florida firms. And then rounding out the top 100, here's the uh, the rest of the, uh, the group here. So uh, yeah, these firms are huge. I mean, the top one, you know, this this last one on the list, Revenues of $43 million, you know, it, it's, it's huge. It's huge. We've got some big, big firms um, in, in uh, Miami. So, yeah, there are the big four. That's where most of our students would like to get a job, where many of our students get their job. Uh, top 10, top 25 firms. A lot of our students are hired by these firms. But remember, uh, there's, there's more fish in the sea than just those top firms. Okay, so now that we're on the subject of placement, um, you know, as, as a former director, I, uh, I know how this used to work. And uh, now with COVID, uh, we, are, we are trying to figure out exactly what we're going to do. And so um, this is some info on what we generally do, and I hope we get something close to it this year. But um, number one is Beta Alpha Psi, Beta Alpha Psi. Oh, great, great, very good, very good. Beta Alpha Psi. Ben Officei is an international honor society for accounting. Uh, we have a chapter, a longtime chapter here at the University of Miami. We've had it uh, since the uh, uh, 60s, very active. And for those of you who don't know, Bade Officei's primary mission is to introduce accounting students to firms and introduce firms to accounting students. It is the number one mechanism of getting students in front of firms and getting the firms in front of students. So I highly recommend you join this honor society. Now with regard to grades, once you're in the graduate program, you qualify. You know, if you're, if you're trying to join as an undergraduate, there are certain grade requirements that you have to meet, uh, but uh, now that you're a graduate student, you can join. There's gonna be some word about their first meeting, uh, and we'll talk more about that uh, in just a couple of minutes. Um, next thing is the career fairs. Yeah. Um, yep. Can I mention something? So, um, Antonella sure. here. Um, I just wanted to say that I was part of Beta Alpha Psi last year, um, and I was a finance student. And with Beta Alpha Psi, I got to meet obviously a whole bunch of accounting firms. And with because of that, I 
they introduced me to, to uh, like I said, different firms and stuff. And with that, I was able to solidify a job at RSM for when I graduate after this accounting program. So I oh think, it's a, yeah, I think it's a super um, valuable like society to be a part of for anybody that is um, interested in it. So yeah. Oh yeah, this is uh, this is uh, this is the way to get the job. This is this is wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you agree? This is like the number one conduit for landing that career position. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, it, it, it really puts you in front of these employers in an intimate, um, I guess, um, environment. Um, and, you know, when you go to the career expos, these employers and these people who are a part of the beta office I, um, uh, meetings, they'll remember yeah. your name and your face. So it, I, yeah. I think it's super, it's an important um, uh, society to be a part of. So, yeah, I yeah, agree. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to pass this up. Thank you so much for chiming in because, you know, I, I sit here and I say this and people are saying, oh, yeah, this professor, he doesn't know anything, but, but it's all true. And, and the thing is, is most of the uh, recruiters and most of the people at the firms were part of beta offside. So you have a common thread, a common discussion point through beta off aside, in addition to a mechanism to be introduced. It's fantastic. And chime in in a couple of minutes when I, when I talk more about beta off side. Okay. Uh, who was that? Antonella? Yeah, Antonella. Antonella. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, now, um, the other thing UM has, we have the, the university-wide career fair. This thing is for everything from art majors, engineering majors, English majors, and accounting majors. Uh, it's pretty good. The big firms will be there. Uh, I suggest that you go. It, this year, they're still saying it's going to be virtual. Uh, I would think by now, with the, with the I mean, you could go to to Walgreens and get your vaccination in five minutes nowadays. I mean, it's like crazy. I don't know why it's going to be virtual still, but it's supposed to be on September 22nd. And I also don't know how a virtual a career fair will work, but I'm sure they've got it worked out. So plan for that. Mark your calendar. Uh, keep in touch with the Topol Career Center um, uh, and, uh, you know, you know, monitor the dates. The other one, and this is huge for us, the Accounting Career Fair. Now, as I was putting together these notes, I, I contacted Daniel Medina and the department chairman about this because I think, based on my experience as former director, it's a little too early. How can you meet firms? How can you uh, polish your, your interviewing skills and everything in just uh, a couple of weeks before you go to the career fair? And so um, we're, uh, it, my email to these guys yesterday uh, may have sparked uh, a little bit of conflict here and we may change the date. They're telling me this one's going to be virtual as well, you know, so I'm not so pleased about that. But uh, Antonello, did you go to a virtual career fair or was it the live one? I went to a uh, virtual. Virtual and it worked out good. Was it okay? I guess it's okay. You got your job. Yeah, no, it was good. It was just, it's, they gave you an allotted 10 minute time with each individual. So for me, I felt it more like it was, it was nicer because I wasn't competing against other people oh, for the attention Wait, of the I individual. Um, cause it was just on that one-on-one, -on -one, but it was a very short time. So you kind of have to have all your questions Antonella. and, huh? Antonella, thank you so much for that input because, uh, let me tell you, when you go to the regular career fair, they've, they've got these tables set up. And so what you've got to do is walk up with your resume and stand in front of the table and say, hi, I'm Mike Warner. And I'd like to talk to somebody here. And you've got to see if they've got time and if they're going to talk to you and everything. If it's virtual and they give you 10 minutes with each firm. That's huge. That's much better than a live than a live career fair. Yeah. So, uh, what, what what do you think, Antonella? Should I push them for a live one or for 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 the uh, the one like you did the uh, the uh, online? I, I like the virtual one for that reason because you really do have that one on one time, and you, I feel like it's more of an impression you, you can give yeah. in person. So, but okay. I'm well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna use your input in my meeting I'm having with them in the next couple of days. But anyway, listen. At this career fair, you, the big four are all there. A bunch of the top national te top ten firms are going to be there. Some of the massive firms like Berkowitz, Pollock, and Brandt. It's a local firm. They've got offices in Miami and Fort Lauderdale. And you say, well. Fort Lauderdale. And you say, well, it's a local firm, but may, let me tell you, this is big. It's their office in Miami is bigger than the big four offices are. I mean, it's huge. It's huge. Anybody getting divorced is, is, is hiring this firm. I mean, anybody who's anybody is working with these big, with Berkowitz uh, and the other big, uh, the big firm. So, so anyway, they're going to be there. Uh, Industry is going to be there. You know, everybody from Disney world has been there in the past. Who knows? Uh, government's going to be there. We've had the IRS there before. We've also had the FBI there. 
uh, last year and the year before the CIA, they don't go to this, but they, they visited classes, including my classes. So if you're into that sort of a thing, that's, uh, I mean, they, they love us. Okay. Uh, and, and it's a wonderful organization to work for if you don't mind moving to Washington DC for a while. Um, and, and then typically after the mixer, if it's live, we would have a happy hour, but I, I don't know that we're going to have that this year. So the department is trying to do things like this, like this, to get the connections made between you and the firms. Now, uh, you, you got to make these connections to get the interviews. So now let's move on a little bit. How else can UM help? Uh, in the past, we've had mock interviews. Hopefully, we'll have those again. They're not even scheduled at this time, but hopefully they will schedule them. I'm going to push for these. And the reason is, is it gives you an opportunity to practice your interviewing skills, to get some feedback. And I got to tell you, I know of a lot of students who are actually hired through the mock interview process. More relaxed, more laid back. The students are more themselves. Their personality shows through. And, um, you know, the firms love the students. So there you go. Uh, we also have an accounting uh, profession panel discussion with about 20 managers and partners that will be there and about, about, nine to 12 that will participate and talk about the accounting careers. So you learn about auditing, you learn about tax, you learn about consulting, you learn about legal support, all those things. It's wonderful. And I'm trying to get this on, on, on the schedule, but we need to have these two things for, if I think you need to have these two things before the uh, career fairs, because otherwise students are not as interested once the career fair is over and the attendance is too low. So uh, any of you guys have any thoughts on that, please chime in. Do you like these things or what do you think? What do you think, guys? You don't like them? How many people think these things are a good idea to have? Raise your hand. Are you guys here? What do you think? That's it? Yeah, I think I think it's a good, good tools. Good tools. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So now, now when, I sent, when I sent this email yesterday, or day before, immediately the department chairman responded to call for a department-wide meeting to see what we're going to do to help you guys get your jobs. So the Department of Accounting, under our leadership, is interested in not only providing an academic background, but also providing placement guidance, help, and opportunity to you guys. So it's all about not only you going through the program, but you succeeding in the program and you landing the job that you want. Now, all that said, what do you do? What do you do to be pre prepared? You can't just sit there and hope it happens. Okay. You can't do that. You have got to go for the brass ring, as they say. Number one, join bait offside. Join bait offside. They have weekly meetings. Now, in the first few weeks of the fall, they're going to have more than weekly meetings. They might have up to three meetings a, a, a week. Why? Because they want, to get the they want to get the meetings in before the career fair. Yeah. How do you join the society? Well, they're going to be sending out an email with their first meeting, and all you got to do is attend the first meeting. Got it. You go to the first meeting and you join up, you know, mm -hmm. and you go to the first meeting and you don't have to join up, you know, but, but, right. Uh, and, and if you miss that meeting, you go to another meeting and, uh, you know, there's some dues that you have to pay and, you know, a little bit of formality, but yeah. And then, and, and so they're going to have weekly meetings at the beginning of the fall firm a term. They're going to have more than one a week because all the firms want to meet you guys. They want to meet you before the career fair to see how interested they are in you. And, uh, and, and, and you know, the thing is, as Antonella said, they're going to know who you are. They're going to remember you. And oddly enough, that's true. How does that happen? It happens because on the way out of the meeting, these firm members, and there's usually three or four of them, they're talking to each other. They are taking notes. They're taking little notes on each one of you. Okay. And, and, and so they know about you and they're collecting information. Why? Because they need to hire people. And if you fit what they're looking for, they're going to want to hire you. So how do you fit? Number one, get good grades. Get good grades. Your job now is to get good grades to impress these employers, okay? Number two, just be yourself. You guys are all great. 
none of you are weird. You're all fine. Just be yourself. And they're going to look at look at you and say, hey, I wouldn't mind having that person in, in the office working with that person. They seem nice. You're going to get the job. OK, so they're looking at you. You look at them. Now, if they're taking notes about you, what do you think you should be doing? Taking notes after each meeting Who was there. What was their name? What did they say? What was the topic? What did this person say? What did that person say? What was this person's position? What's that person's position? And I say that because when a career fair comes around, you may be interviewing with one of them. And to talk about things that happened during their beta side meeting is going to make your job as a student trying to land a job a lot easier. Okay. So all the big four will be there, all of them. And for many of them, like KPMG, they're recruiting not just for Miami, but nationally, nationally, okay? And I think Deloitte is too. Um, because one of Deloitte's, uh, the, the not the current CEO, but the one that just stepped down a few couple of years ago, um, he's a former UM uh, uh, graduate. You know, he's got his accounting degree from the University of Miami, the CEO of Deloitte. Um, many other top firms, uh, they've got office visits, all kinds of activities. And the meetings tend to be pretty e interesting. So make sure that you join uh, Badoff side. Um, participate in the mock interviews if we pull it off and we have it. Attend the accounting uh, uh, profession panel discussion. Attend the discussion. And if you can, interact with the people at the firms. Uh, uh, learn, meet various CPAs, managers, partners, have fun with all of this. Have a good time. Have a good time. Be yourself. Be relaxed. Uh, dress, you know, nicely. Uh, and uh, that way, when it's time for the actual interviewing season to start, you'll get some interviews. And I can tell you from past experience as the director I had students with, I had one student had a GPA of 3.95 GPA. Could you imagine? He did not land a single interview. Why? He didn't join Beta Psi. Didn't go to the career fair because he had family obligations. And so the firms never met him. He did not get one interview. Okay. So in order for you to land an interview, the firms need to see you. They need to know you. Okay. So there you go. For uh, our Chinese friends, um, it, it's even more difficult because of all of the you know legal legal situation with visas and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but those students from China that have wanted to stay in the United States, um, they've they you know we are uh, you know uh, we're one of the universities that can offer extended time to stay for internship and training in the United States up to like three years. And in that time period, you're going to get a job. You're going to get a good job. Uh, it, it, it just tends to be a little bit more difficult for our Chinese friends. So your placement participation, try your ever best to be an active participant in the placement process. Uh, you know, Say hello to the recruiters. Don't just run out of the meeting. Uh, take notes about the meeting, about the firm, about the presenters so that you have that handy. Uh, prepare and update your resume. Keep it with you all the time. Maybe even consider getting some of those UM student business cards that you can hand out, uh, you know, uh, as appropriate. Might not need many of them, but, you know, they might be handy. So here again, my experience. My experience is, and this is from you know my time as director, during normal non-COVID times, firms do not interview individuals they have not met before. That's just what happens. So you got to participate. You got to go to the events. You got to you know you got to be an active participant. Therefore, you should take every opportunity to see and be seen at the recruiting events. Just go have fun. Okay, be yourself. You know. And, and it also gives you an opportunity to learn about firms, to see how the people at the firms dress so that you can, you know, because if you go to work for one of these firms during the interview, I mean, if you go to an interview, you're going to want to dress like those guys dress. You know, you want to dress like you already work there. Um, uh, you know, what is their demeanor? What's their attitude? You know, and if it, there's a little difference from one firm to the next. So it may help you select the firms that are really your favorites. Any questions about all this? I know we've really spent a lot of time on it, but but it's like, you know, uh, I, like I say, as former director, it, 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 as somebody who really cares mostly about, you know, not only 
you know, what you learn here in the course, but also getting that job that you really want and helping you out as much as possible. I, I think it was, it's time well spent. Any questions about all this? Any questions? Anything? Okay, well, if you have any questions for me later, I am here for you. No problem. So the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, chapter one in our intermediate accounting book. This has to do with financial accounting standards. Now, before I get into that, I should say that accounting is all about information. And information, it doesn't matter what you're doing, buying a house, buying a car, buying a, buying a, buying a new mobile phone, you're getting a mobile phone, okay? Uh, it's easier to make a decision about what phone to get once you get information about the phones or what phone service to get, you know, or what neighborhood to buy your home in or what car to buy. And my God, what options do you want on that car? Before you buy any car, you better make sure that you know what options are available and that you get every one that you want because after the car's made, they can't add on later, okay? So having information helps make good decisions, decisions you're going to be happy with for a long time to come. Now, in business, it's, it's, the, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Uh, we need information to make decisions. And so uh, what kind of information? Well, accounting provides a huge amount of this information. Financial reporting, which are, you know, the financial statements and so forth, financial reports, financial statements. So all of this stuff here is very valuable to help somebody decide whether they should invest in a company or perhaps lend the company money. Uh, what you don't want to rely on is just the fact that you like the company. Oh, I love the company. It's got such, I love Uber. It's such a great idea. I take Uber all the time. I'm going to invest. Uh, uh, uh. No, no, no. Don't do that. Look at the financial statements first. And once you do, you will not be investing in Uber. Okay. Um, but sometimes, oh, I love Apple. Apple's so cool. I would invest. Oh, yeah, Apple's pretty good. Apple's good. Yeah, you'd probably invest in them after you look at their financial reports. Okay. Then we have all kinds of financial schedules. Moving on to management accounting, we have budgets, forecasts about what the business is expected to do and what we need to do to facilitate that business. Sales reports by product, by salesperson, by region, and so forth. Expense reports and various other reports. And all of this reporting and lots and lots more help managers run businesses and make good financial decisions. For you, when you're buying a phone, you want to get information about telephones to buy the phone. In business, if you're making a decision, you need to get information. And a lot of that, just by its nature, is accounting information. That's where the information comes from. So gone are the days when accountants sit there with green visors and they add up a bunch of numbers and all this stuff. Computers are taking care of all that menial work. Accountants are involved in high-end preparation and arrangement of information to help decision makers. It's, it, it's cool. It's cool. And understanding that information, which accountants really understand it, really helps make the best information, best decisions. So with respect to accounting, there's basically internal users and external users of information. And you guys know this from your earlier classes. Internal, uh, I mean, let's talk about external users of information are, are, are the, the folks that are considering buying stock in the company or, or lending money to the company. They are external to the company. They are not part of the company. Now, where is the dividing line drawn? The dividing line is drawn between, between uh, whether you're an employee or not. If you're an employee, if you're employed by the company, if you work for the company, and it could be board of directors, an officer, all the way down to the janitor. If you work for the company, if you're employed by the company, you are uh, an internal user. If you're not an employee of the company, you're an external user. Hey, what if I own stock in the company? What if I own the company? External user. Just because you own the company doesn't mean you're an internal user. You're external. To be internal, you've got to be an employee. Now, that sounds crazy. I own the company and I'm not an internal user. Sounds crazy, but it's really not. Because a lot of people, like I own, you know, let's say that, that you own uh, a 1,000 shares of Disney stock. That doesn't make you an insider. That doesn't make you an internal user. You're still just a, an external shareholder, you see. Uh, internal users are employees. 
employed by the company and external users are everybody else. Here's some examples, you know, internal users work within the organization, you know, marketing guys, finance guys, employee relations guys, you know, all answering questions with accounting information, external uh, decision makers. These are the folks who are thinking about, you know, investing in a company. It would include uh, potential and, and current stockholders, potential and current uh, uh, customer creditors, uh, banks, uh, lending institutions, suppliers, uh, possible uh, potential and uh, current bondholders. Others would include suppliers, uh, customers. If you're buying a very expensive lathe to the tune of $100,000, you might want to look into the company supplying the lathe to make sure that they're financially strong and can support that lathe, you know, as the years go by. So customers, uh, potential and current employees. Really, I guess I guess it should be just the potential employees. Current employees are, are insiders, right? But I'm thinking if you want to get a job with any company, including one of these CPA firms, you're, you're an outsider, but you can get a wealth of information about the company, about the organization. And, and it's probably a good idea for you to do that. Uh, government institutions of all kinds, uh, the Internal Revenue Service for taxes, the SEC for financial reporting, and many, many, many others. Here's some of the uh, decisions that they might be making. You know, current investors, should we invest, should we not? You know, what earnings can we expect, so on and so forth. So there you can take a look at this later. So now let's talk about the difference between financial accounting. That would be financial accounting. That's the introduction to financial accounting. Intermediate one, which is 311 and 332. Intermediate two, which is 312 and 333, 411, which is consolidations or what we call advanced accounting for financial accounting versus management accounting, which would be management accounting, cost accounting, which would be 301 undergraduate, 334, which is the course you guys will be taking, or a, a high end graduate course, which I don't think we're even offering anymore, which would be 604, very lofty cost accounting course. I used to teach that, and uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty lofty. Uh, anyway, uh, Financial accounting. Financial accounting is uh, for external decision makers, external decision makers, where um, management accounting and cost accounting is for internal decision makers. Financial accounting is prepared annually or quarterly, and it takes a while for the reports to be released. They don't release the reports like right away. On the other hand, uh, management accounting. The information is prepared more frequently, like monthly, weekly, daily, hourly, moment by moment, real time. It's prepared as managers need and demand the information. And the information is available quickly, sometimes, most of the times, immediately on real time. If you want to know today's sales, if I want to know Pittman Photo sales for today, I can call Pittman Photo and they can give me their sales as of today. Within, within 30 seconds, I'm going to have the number. Uh, not so for uh, financial reporting. Uh, generally, financial accounting is historical, is historical information. There are a few projections, you know, like estimated earnings per shares and so forth. Uh, but uh, generally, it's historical. And we, we like it that way. Why? Because we think if we allow companies to make too many projections, um, they might overstep. They might exaggerate how good they're going to be doing next year. So it's better that we limit, you know, financial accounting information to the presentation of historical information, things that have already happened. Where management accounting, it's historical, surely. Yeah, I mean, we, we have some historical information, but based on that historical information, we jump ahead, woo, forward, and we make projections, budgets, where it's more forward looking, and we've got more more uh, uh, projections, more forecasting, more budgets, so that, you know, for next year, we already know what we anticipate in the way of sales by product, uh, costs by cost type. You know, we can even take it to the point where we develop a set of financial statements for uh, 2022 before the year even begins. Much more forward looking, and it needs to be forward looking so that we can plan and get everything in line and act accordingly 
so that our future is as bright as it can possibly be. We're well prepared to do it, okay? Uh, financial accounting is less detailed. Generally, it's, very, it's not detailed at all, not detailed at all. Now, you may argue and say, oh, no, that's not true. I've done an income statement and a balance sheet, very detailed, all those little categories, and you gotta get them in right order. It seems detailed, but it's really not detailed. It is not detailed. All you provide on an income statement is one sales figure. That's it. One big cost of goods sold figure. That's it. On the other hand, management accounting information, cost accounting information, very detailed. Instead of one sales figure, it's sales, product by product, customer by customer, package by package, cost. Uh, not only the cost of goods sold, but each individual product's cost of goods sold and each individual product's, you know, profitability. Um, it, it's just a, an enormously detailed uh, reporting system uh, when it comes to management accounting, because to know, you know, total sales doesn't help any manager anywhere. You need the sales, you know, if, you, if you're managing the Apple store in Dadeland, you need to know what the sales are for that store. And you need to know how many of these phones you're selling versus the more modern phones, right? You know, how many of these things are we selling? What color do people want, you know, and so forth. Um, and this is all part of accounting information. Very, very detailed. Rules. Um, financial accounting must conform to generally accepted accounting principles. Gap. Got to conform to gap. There are a specific set of rules that we use in the United States. Uh, it constitutes U.S. GAAP. Internationally, there's another set of rules, the International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS. So financial reporting has to follow those rules. But any way you look at it, financial reporting must conform to rules and regulations set forth in the United States by the FASB. And if you're an SEC registrant, by the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. Um, now, what about management accounting? No rules. There are no rules. It, it, all you got to do is conform to the company's rules and regulations. No governmental standards, no outside bodies, nothing, nothing. It's, and the reason for this is, is, is companies are able to self-police the information. As an outsider, you cannot dictate to the company what information they're going to present to you. You get what you get. And therefore, generally accepted accounting principles are in place to help protect you as an investor. On the other hand, if you work for the company, hey, you can go talk to the accountant and get the information done any way you like, you say. Let me talk about GAAP for a minute and why we need GAAP. Why do we need generally accepted accounting principles? And uh, this need is sort of has its, you know, has its roots from back in the 1920s in the United States. Let me tell you what I mean. Back in the 1920s and before, there was no real gap. There were no rules that companies had to follow. So some companies prepared an, an income statement, an income statement. You know, they just did the income statement, um, but nothing else. Some companies did a balance sheet, but nothing else. Some companies did the income statement and balance sheet, but the accounting they did was not uniform from company to company. Some companies, for example, on their balance sheet, they valued their assets at cost, historical cost, where other companies would depict their assets at their current um, fair value. And so there's a lot of dis disparity between, you know, all this information. There's a lot of a lot of differences in the information that was provided. And, it, it, and since sometimes they were providing, you know, just one of the statements, it was incomplete. So what happened? Let's, as an example, assume that you each have $50,000 to invest. $50,000. Let me write the amount down here. $50,000 has a nice ring to it. Not a massive amount, but still enough. An amount that you would desperately not want to lose. It would be a good down payment on an apartment. It could buy a nice car. So you have this money and you want to invest it. And you decide you're going to invest it in the stock market. And you look at the financial statements that are available. Now, this is back in the 1920s. And you find two companies that you really like. Company A and Company B. 
Now, the reason you like them is because company A looks, their financial statements look good. Financial statements look good. Man, this looks great. Really nice. In company B, though, company B, it also looks good. So you're pretty happy that you found two good companies uh, that you can invest in. So what happens? What happens? You go ahead and you decide that you are going to split the investment up. You're going to split the investment. Uh, anyway, so you decide that you're going to put 25,000 in this company and 25,000 in this company. So you got 25,000 in each company. And uh, so time marches on. And as time goes on, as time goes on, uh, we have a problem. Company A defaults on an interest payment, on a bond. They miss an interest payment, and it turns out they are running out of cash. And, they're, and, and, and the company is really uh, just about to fold. And what happens then is everybody starts selling the stock. And I mean, there is a run on this company's stock and the stock price plummets. I mean, it plummets. And so now your $25,000 investment, it goes all the way down to say, I just make it up a number, $1,000, $1,000. So your, one of your investments of $25,000 is now worth a thousand bucks. So that's where you stand. This is worth a thousand. This one is at 25,000. This company looked good, but it wasn't. This company looked good, so what's your next move? What's your next move? Anybody got a move for me? What would you do? You've just lost all your money here almost. What are you going to do? What most of us would do is say, oh my God, this company looked great. It went right down the tubes. I lost my almost my entire investment. I'm selling this one too before I get stung here, right? So you sell. Now, it's not just you selling. It's everybody selling. Everybody is stung by this. Everybody starts selling. This stock price also plummets down to, I don't know, $2,000. This one also plummets because everybody evaluated this. They thought it looked great and it wasn't. And then they thought, well, I've made a mistake here. So they start selling. Now, now as it turns out, this company here, just so you know, this company is good. This company, not only does it look good, but it's very successful. The problem is you had no way of knowing that. You had no way of knowing that because there were no accounting rules in place that helped uh, assure that the information that you were getting was complete and accurate. So in the late 1920s, 1928, 1929, the stock market crashed like crazy. Uh, it was devastating for the country. People uh, lost their investments. All the rich people that hired the poor people, that employed the poor people, uh, they fired all the poor people. Nobody was earning any money. Uh, my grandparents told me how my grandmother and my uncle and some other people said, they said, oh, yeah, during the Depression, I would stand on the street corner and sell apples for a nickel just to get enough money to eat. That's what they told me. Horrible stories. But then I got to tell you, I started thinking, all these people are saying they sold apples on a corner for a nickel to get something to eat. I thought, how could everybody be selling apples? I mean, you know, so I don't know if I believe it. Every, uh, everybody would be selling apples. Not only that, but if they're getting money to get something to eat, why don't they just <coughs> eat the apple? You know what I mean? So, but, so, so, so anyway, I'm not sure how bad it was, but it was bad. So the government steps in and they got to figure out what to, what to do and why it happened. Well, who do you blame for some big business thing? Who did they blame for Enron? Who did they blame for Tyco? Who gets blamed for every big business calamity? What gets blamed? You know, accounting. The government figured this out. And it was because accounting information was so poor, it misled investors. And so the federal government in 1933 and 1934 created the Securities and Exchange Commission to police publicly traded companies. And as part of the deal, they charged the SEC with the responsibility of making sure that GAAP was created, that GAAP was created. So GAAP was created because of what I just mentioned in response to the Great Depression. 
And they were charged with the responsibility to see that gap was created so that this would never happen again. But oddly enough, the SEC did not have the had to create the gap itself. The law did not say the Securities and Exchange Act did not say that they had to the SEC had to create gap, but rather they had to make sure that it was created. And so they they went on this rampage to see if they can get it created. And who steps up to the plate? The AICPA, which is basically an accounting club. The AICPA, even to this day, American Institute of Certified Public Accountants is the most powerful accounting club on the planet. Okay. You got to be a CPA to join, but they are nonetheless a club that is, you know, is all for CPAs. And so the CPA said, hey, hey, hey guys, we'll help, we'll help. And so they stepped in and they created the Committee on Accounting Procedures called CAP, Committee on Accounting Procedures called CAP. And they created accounting research bulletins. They created like, uh, I think, 51 of them, 51 bulletins. And they were in place from 1939, just a few years after the SEC was created, to 1959. So about 20 years, 1959. And, um, and they created, yeah, yeah, here we go, 51 accounting research bulletins called ARBs. Now, they used a problem by problem approach. So if they they sensed a problem in the accounting for some area that was really, you know, a difficulty, they would address it and they would create one of these ARBs. People call them ARBs. And uh, uh, the thing is, is they really didn't have a good structure coming together for the general creation of GAP. And it was it, it, it ranged in size from eight members to 22 members, eight members to 22 members. So quite a few members. So because of this catches catch can problem by problem approach and, and, and that th th there was no structure, in 1959, the AICPA, same accounting club, created another group called the Accounting Principles Board, the APB, really famous, APB. And it was active from 1959 to 1973. Now, like the uh, uh, like CAP, and CAP was all composed of CPAs. They're all CPAs because you had to be in an AICPA to be in CAP. So you're all CPAs. Um, the Accounting Principles Board was made up primarily of CPAs. Now, there might have been a couple of academics in there, but mostly CPAs. Ranged in membership from 18 to 22 members, and they issued a whopping 31 APB opinions. And they'd call these like APB number four. That was a real famous one. APB number four, APB number 31. And so these, uh, the APB created all this. Now, the thing is, all of these accounting pronouncements stayed in full force even after the body quit its work. So after 59, the uh, CAPS research bulletins stayed in place. And that was GAP. Uh, also, the APB op opinions, they stayed in place after 1973 as GAP. OK, so when this this was created as gap, when the board went away. The accounting principles that they created did not go away. They stayed in place. Then in 1973, the FASB was formed, was put in place. The pre 1973 to present, I mean, till right now, you've got the uh, Financial Accounting Standards Board, the FASB, Financial Accounting Standards Board. Now, it is made up of a number of different bodies, and I've got the main ones listed here. The first one is called the Financial Accounting Foundation. So back, I think, even as early as 1972, the Financial Accounting Foundation was being created, the FAF, Financial Accounting Foundation. Now, it is sort of the, the, uh, the oversight body, okay, the one that runs the FASB. So the FASB cannot run amok and do whatever it wants. It's got the Financial Accounting Foundation that watches over it. And so the F Financial Accounting Foundation selects the FASB members, okay? It also provides the funding to the FASB. The FASB members don't have to go out looking for money. The money is given to them by the Financial Accounting Foundation. The Financial Accounting Foundation has to look for money, but, but you know, for donations and contributions and government support and so forth. But uh, that money then is, is funnel, funneled through in a purified fashion to the FASB. The Financial Accounting Foundation also provides general oversight over the FASB. So the FASB can't just do whatever they want. Now, the FASB has seven board members. 
and it's the group that creates or writes GAP. Since 1973 till today, they've been writing GAP. And every couple of years, there are new board members. So board members are coming and going and coming and going, coming and going. And you would think that because of that, the pronouncements would vary, you know, all over the map. But as it turns out, they, they are fairly uniform, and we'll talk about why in just a little bit. So seven members. For a short period of time, they went down to five members to save money. Uh, that didn't work out too well. So after about three years, they went back to the seven members, and I think it will be seven members from here on out. Uh, so now, in addition to the FASB that writes, you know, that's the board, you know, that meets and creates all the gap, they do have the Financial Accounting Standards Advisory Council. And they, they consult them on major policy issues, technical issues. You know, these, there's only seven FASB members, only seven. And they do not possess the wealth of information about every area of accounting. And therefore, they need input. And the input comes from the technical, you know, from this Financial Accounting Standards Advisory Council and from their staff, which is pretty wildly uh, competent and been there a long time. Uh, large staff. The building, I mean, they have their own building in, in uh, Connecticut. It, it's quite a place to visit. Uh, they have uh, places for the, you know, to have the big meetings that they have uh, so that you can, uh, you know, they can collect input on all the pronouncements that they're writing and so forth. Um, and uh, the Financial Accounting Standards Advisors, Advisory Council also uh, works with the selection organization of the FASB task forces. And so if there's a particular issue at play and we need some additional input as to how to handle it, um, the uh, uh, advisory council will put together a task force to help push it through. Now, there are some advantages to the FASB. You know, why do we, why do we go from the APB, which actually was very well respected and did a fairly good job. Why did we go to the FASB? Why is it better? First of all, the APB had 18 members and the FASB has smaller membership. And, and so it's much easier to manage and to get things done with seven members than this whopping 18 members. And so that's viewed as an advantage. Another huge advantage is that unlike the APB, where everybody that worked for the APB, they were part-time workers. They were they, they, part-time. They weren't even part-time workers. They weren't employees. They were volunteers. They were volunteers. They would show up, catch as catch can. I am on the APB. I'll go to a meeting. Yeah. Can you make the meeting? I, I hope so. You know, they're volunteers and, um, and they had other jobs. They worked for, you know, uh, Coopers and Libran, you know, they worked for Deloitte. They worked for, and, 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 and so they, they really had loyalty to these other places. Uh, here at the FASB, they're full-time employees. If you're appointed as an FASB member, that's your job. That's where you're going to work. You're moving to Connecticut, full-time employers. We don't have to, employees. We don't have to worry about them, you know, whether they will have time in their schedule to show up or not. They will be there. This is their job. All the APB members were volunteers. They weren't paid, where FASB members are, they're paid, paid. Every uh, position at the FASB is their paid positions. And the FASB members, as you might imagine, are very well paid. APBA uh, and Accounting Principles Board was part of the AICPA. It was part of the accounting club where the FASB has greater autonomy. It's not part of any club, not the AICPA, not part of the government, not part of the SEC. It's its own body uh, apart from everywhere else. It, it's not part of any club or other organization. APB, APB members uh, would continue their work for uh, their firms, you know, for their accounting firm or wherever they work, where uh, you have increased independence with the FASB because if you're appointed to the, FA, to the FASB, you must sever all ties with your former employers. You got to quit. You, you, the FASB would be your only job you got to quit Pricewaterhouse or wherever, and now you're going to go work for the FASB. That's it. Um, now, the AB, AP, uh, APB members were basically CPAs uh, because it's required to be a member of the ICPA, where under for the uh, FASB, it's got much broader representation. You don't have to be a CPA 
to be on the FASB. In fact, there is always out of the seven members, one academic, one academic that's appointed, and at least one non-CPA, sort of a financial sort uh, that is on the board. So it's not just CPAs. It's not just CPAs. So there's a lot of advantages, you know, in addition to the better organization, better stewardship and so forth. Um, the FASB has other advantages. Some of the, uh, the members here. Um, he's from Ernst & Young. So he's a former CPA. He was a partner in charge of Ernst & Young. So there you go, Richard Jones. We got this guy. You see how stern he looks? You see him there? He's smiling ear to ear for this picture. From every time I've seen this guy, this would be the happiest I've ever seen him. Um, now, when I saw him, he, he worked for the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, and he was the chief accountant for the Securities and Exchange Commission. Very powerful and high level uh, position, very serious individual. Uh, not sure if he's a CPA or not, but it doesn't matter. He's got a wealth, a wealth of knowledge uh, that he brings from the SEC. And he was he was uh, at the SEC as the chief accountant during this very turbulent time from 2009 to 2012, when the SEC was considering switching from uh, US GAAP to IFRS, which is which we're, we're not going to do, but at least it, it is considered from time to time and was under heavy consideration back then. So that's uh, another member. Um, this is a Professor Badasan from the School of Business at the University of Utah. Okay, so I'm counting professor. Um, this is a portfolio manager. So Buser is a portfolio manager, uh, you know, in charge of huge investments. Cosper. Unbelievable. She was FASB's technical director in in chair of the Emerging Issues Tax Force previously. So uh, this is one of the geniuses that they've had working for the FASB, okay? So she's probably one of their top-notch people. And um, the thing about the staff, they're there for many, many years, usually. They're there for many years, where FASB members are there for a few years, and then they rotate out, right? They rotate in, they rotate out, where some of the staff members have been there since. Some of them have been there almost from the beginning, although some of them are retiring now. Ms. Hunt, who is, um, yeah, got a lot of knowledge about, uh, you know, uh, corporate accounting and so forth. Um, she, uh, she actually comes from industry. I don't know if you know Cummins, but any of you who are familiar with trucking and big equipment would know that Cummins makes one of the best diesel engines on the planet. That's the motor you want to have in your Kenworth or Peterbilt tractor. And so huge business. And that's where she was from. So she's from industry. Schroeder, partner at uh, Carlson Capital, Dallas-based money manager. So there you go. There you go. That's the FASB as it is today. So not just CPAs, but a whole diverse group. Now, GAP is a mixture of pronouncements. As I said before, the ARBs and APB opinions, they don't disappear. They don't go away unless they're superseded by uh, a new FASB pronouncement, okay? And so if you were trying to you know, look into revenue recognition for your company, you might have to look at... Uh, uh, ARBs, APB opinions, and new FASB pronouncements to pull it all together. And this would be in different areas of a, a book of accounting gap, which is, you know, as thick as a, a, a dictionary. It's huge. And so you'd have to look all over the place. And this was a pretty bad situation. And it, it, it made it difficult to use, you know, difficult to really follow and pinpoint what gap really was. So what happened a few years ago is 
they did what they call the FASB Accounting Standards Codification. And with this, they organized all of the pronouncements together in a one place, you know, atmosphere. So if you want to look at revenue recognition, you look at revenue recognition, it's all there in one place. If you want to look at leases, you go to the section on leases, and it's all pretty much there in one place. If you want to look at how to account for property, plant, and equipment, all pretty much there in one place. So that's what we're using nowadays is this accounting codification. Now, the pronouncements that are issued by the FASB would include accounting uh, standard updates, accounting standard updates. The FASB issues several accounting standard updates every year. Some of them uh, deal, many, many of them deal with obscure topics that really don't have a great deal of impact on the majority of companies. But sometimes they, 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 have, uh, they, they are more general in nature and have massive impact, such as the new pronouncement on leases that came out or if they make a new pronouncement on pensions or, you know, what have you, uh, they, they have huge impact. So, so the amount of impact is different from one pronouncement to the next. The length of the, uh, the statements are different, but uh, the, the, the new gap is sort of put out there in the form of these accounting standards updates. Also, the, another uh, uh, document would be the, the statements of accounting concepts. The, the, the accounting concepts make up the FASB's conceptual framework. Now, I know I've only got a minute here, but let me just tell you about this just briefly. Remember, there's new FASB members sort of rotating in through the FASB and back out again every couple of years. How do they create consistent pronouncements from one group to the next, from one period to the next? They do it through this conceptual framework. They have created and continue to create a conceptual framework with the objectives and concepts that they use to develop future standards. So the conceptual framework, oddly enough, does not establish gap. It's not gap, but rather it's the concepts that the FASB is going to be using as they form gap. So I noticed that it's eight o'clock. It's eight o'clock. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say end here, end the end for tonight. I appreciate your attention. Uh, in the future, I hope you guys uh, holler out more when I ask a question, raise your hand, whatever, so we get more participation. But uh, next time we get together, we'll continue with this discussion of chapter one, move on to chapter two. Hopefully we can get through that touchy-feely chapter two uh, pretty quickly and move on to chapter four. So uh, three is for a later time. So listen, everybody, thank you and have a, a great night. We will see you, uh, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thanks now. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Janice. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Jose. Take care. You too. You too. See you tomorrow.